So welcome everyone. So find the word that you want to greet everybody. So is it aloha? Is it maayong um, pagabot? Um, is it talitari, peifa, benbinar, and all the other languages around the world? So again, welcome amidst the pandemic that we're going through. We always have to smile and be happy because first and foremost, we are alive. And secondly, we are responsible for the children entrusted to our care. So we continue to develop our three T's, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Again, welcome everyone to our session. So these are the objectives for our uh, session today. To identify the challenges, opportunities, and best practices in management during pandemic based on the assessment from the World Health Organization, the National Association of Independent School, the International Labor Law, and uh, my experience being an administrator myself, the REAL experience. So actually REAL stands for Region 8 Administrators League. All right, so at the back of me is my block and certificate from our recently concluded awarding ceremonies of AHA. AHA stands for Administrators Honorific Awards and, and I'm humbled to receive uh, such award being a recipient. All right, so I guess you also have your own uh, leagues of administrators in your respective regions and it's a good initiative to recognize the meritorious contributions of the people working, right? especially the administrators, because in many instances, the administrators are no longer recognized, no? because we are the ones who are recognizing our people working for us. So there is an umbrella organization that would recognize these administrators. Okay, so sit back and relax as we continue our session for today. Okay, so let me pose this question to you. As administrator or manager, what are your challenges, opportunities, and best practices during this pandemic? I'm pretty sure that you have your own responses to that. So maybe uh, just think what are those, and then later on, you will be given the time to respond to that because you will have a separate worship for this. Okay. So based on the World Health Organization, there is an intra-action review overview and there were three steps that uh, they assessed in the review. Number one is what went well during the pandemic time and then what went less well and then the response to that why and then the step two what can we do to improve the COVID-19 response so I'm pretty sure at this point in time you already have established uh, protocols uh, you already have identified your best practices um, in responding to COVID-19 challenges no? and then the step three uh, done was the way forward. So what are the takeaways? What are the ways forward um, during this pandemic time? So under step one, we have the following items. What went well? What went less well and why? So using the trigger questions, identify the challenges and best practices during the response. Number two, for each uh, challenge and best practice, identify impact this has had on the response during the period under review. And then for each challenge and best practice, identify limiting factors for challenges and facilitating factors for best practice. And then number four, identify no more than six key challenges and six uh, key best practices. So in the next presentation, uh, I'll be sharing with you the responses to these items based on the results of the study from World Health Organization. OK, 
Okay, so under best practices and uh, strengths, so we have regular cross-border coordination meetings. Indeed, it's very essential that there should be uh, meetings, and especially not only within the agency, but it can be interagency collaboration of the different agencies um, that are involved right and what's the impact of that so because of the regular cross-border coordination meetings so there is an improved coordination and sharing of information for the early detection of suspected or confirmed cases and for monitoring uh, contacts that is if it's something related to health no? but if it's something related to education then if there are also problems detected in terms of uh, academic performance and behavioral problems of the students, then there should be an early detection to that also so that uh, we can facilitate how we can support our learners. All right. And the eight factors uh, under that would be the relationship had been established prior to the response and it's very important that there should be a good and harmonious relationship among the people working together working closely and then the willingness of all stakeholders to undertake regular meetings it's really challenging sometimes because it's also time consuming meeting the people and especially this pandemic so usually it's more of virtual meetings you know, or creating group chats so the group chat has been there to facilitate uh, meetings and then political and financial support from central level or from higher level or from the mother agency uh, for that matter if there is a mother agency and then challenges we have coordination at local level um, is ineffective so sometimes um, there's really a problem about the coordination at the local level right and it has to be resolved and then the impact for that also is the response not coordinated between partners, health authorities, and the central level. So there the problem lies if uh, there is ineffective coordination because uh, the response also will be problematic. And then at times there is a duplication of activities in effort because the people involved are not communicating. So it's very important that there should be communication as well. And the limiting factors is um, there is a lack of plan uh, in the level coordination and then partners are not participation participating in the coordination meeting. So that's very important that this is well disseminated so all the agencies involved are informed and uh, they also get to participate in all the activities and then there should be sharing of activities um, information so that uh, there will be no duplication of the activities being conducted okay under step one also um, we have important definitions to remember best practice something that was done during the COVID-19 response that improved performance or had a positive impact so what is it that you have done which you consider as a best practice all right um, the examples for our development of new uh, SOPs or statement of problems for COVID-19 diagnosis and then organization of cross-border meetings during the COVID-19 response to facilitate better coordination so like in the university level maybe one of the best practice examples that I could share is the establishment of the academic kiosks where we coordinated with the local government unit and then the supplier of the internet connection and then we set up um, computers connected to internet and then those who don't have uh, gadgets and internet connectivity at home so they can go to the academic kiosks and then uh, access the modules and uh, if there are more computers set up they can even go synchronous, synchronous classes so i really consider that as a best practice also, one of the best practices now is uh, making the campus or the university uh, wired, no? Wired. So the connection, the communication of the people in the university becomes easier because uh, it becomes a smart campus, 
right? So I guess that is also another um, best practice. And I'm pretty sure that you're also doing this. Another best practice that you might be doing is um, creating Google Forms, no? Where you don't have to print it and then ask the people to answer or uh, deliver the communications. But through Google Forms, we could generate uh, data and then we could even interpret the data. Yeah, because of the generated information. All right. Then next is challenge. Job, duty, or situation that is difficult during the COVID-19 response because you must use a lot of effort, determination, and skill in order to be successful. That is a challenge. Example is lack of coordinated communication between OH and partners and then limited capacity for COVID-19 testing at sub-national level. So in our respective agencies also, like for me being in the SUC, uh, one of the challenges is um, the people reporting for work because when we implemented before the uh, work from home scheme, no? uh, it's very hard because uh, there are some people who could not really function on a work from home basis. So. That was a bit challenged because the functions and roles of the different employees were not performed because they were working from home. And in some instances even, they would say that they're not going to uh, sign the documents because they're working from home. <laughs> they don't know the essence of working from home. Working from home means uh, you perform the job that you're supposed to do um, in the office even if you are at home. because. Working from home is not working for your home. Uh, working office work while you are at home, right? So I hope that is very clear to our employees. Okay. All right, so under step two, what can we do to improve the COVID-19 response? So we identified earlier uh, the good practices. So that is a matrix that you want to, if you want to follow, if you want to have a survey yourself, then what are the impacts and what are the aping factors, the challenges and the limiting factors. So I presented to you the table earlier. So geared towards that is the plan to institutionalize best practices and then address challenges. It's very important that if you have established the best practice, then keep doing it because that is very essential. And then if there are challenges, of course, we have to address them. So like in the sharing I had earlier about the establishment of academic kiosks, so I guess it has been there for almost two years now and we see that it's very efficient uh, to help our students who don't have the gadgets and internet connectivity. So we continue with that uh, best practice. So, and the challenges as well, then we have to look at the challenges and propose solutions for that. Okay, and then under that would be the development of specific activities. What should we do so that we would be able to address the challenges? So what are the enabling factors that we need to do? And then what, how are we going to address the limiting factors as I identified earlier in our uh, previous uh, slide? All right, so maybe we could concretize this with uh, what particular challenge okay so if the challenge for example is the internet uh, connectivity then what are we going to do okay because at the moment for example uh, region 8 again is hit by typhoon Udet and uh, signal has been weak for a few days now and I'm having difficulty uh, connecting so what are we doing then we could not just uh, do so much so therefore we have to uh, communicate to the people uh, face to face uh, that's the better option that we are doing at this time so in fact when i was working on the nominations for aha since we could not um, download files from Yahoo from mail so what I did was 
I connected through Messenger because it's easier to send files through Messenger. So thanks to Messenger for the support. So there are many things that uh, we can do to solve the problem, to address the challenges that uh, we have. So, well, that's only an example, but I'm pretty sure that you have your own experiences as well. Okay? So another is, what can we do to improve the COVID-19 uh, response? So we have here an example. The activity is conduct half-day training of first staff from regional laboratory and sample management, for example. And then uh, key implementation steps and required resources. So we have a uh, percentage of statement of the problems updated, development of training materials, and then logistics would be secure meeting room and workshop supplies and then the indicators would be percentage of people trained who can manage properly the samples. Okay, and sort of reminders, uh, all activities need to be practical and realistic. Something that we can really do and then several activities might be necessary to address a single challenge or a best practice and then not all best practices or challenges need an activity so for example uh, since we are now required to have a limited face-to-face -face, uh, classes and the university cannot uh, accommodate all the students who come so therefore uh, we had to choose a certain degree or courses that would be accommodated so instead of the whole programs uh, accommodated so we only chose um, IT and then uh, hotel and restaurant management for example so and then still we cannot accommodate all the students from first year up to fourth year college so we decided to focus on uh, students who are on the job training especially for IT and hotel restaurant management because these are hands-on activities these are laboratories so we zero in to, to them because that's uh, what we can provide and then uh, to observe protocols and to avoid exposure maybe to the possibility of acquiring COVID so uh, we plan to provide accommodation so where the students will be housed maybe for a one month so maybe it's like a camp so we're going to divide all the students into different uh, groups no? Uh, different cycles and then uh, a group of them would report for a month and then another group would report for a month and then they experience uh, the actual training in the laboratories and then up to the assessment period yeah because you know it's good to be asking the students to submit videos for their cooking classes but uh, will you be there to taste the food if it's really palatable so the best way really is uh, an actual cooking class and then the tasting session of the food no? so that's one of the things that uh, we should prioritize no? uh, what is practical and realistic so not all students can be accommodated and also in IT because uh, the instructor should be there to see how the students program uh, work on applications that's very important that uh, they are being guided by the professors in terms of programming okay and of course the step three which is the way forward um, is an identification of what can be addressed immediately to improve the ongoing response, what can be done in the mid and long term to improve response to the next waves of the COVID-19 outbreak, establishment of the intra-action review follow-up team, then process to document progress in implementing the recommendations, and then approach to ensure engagement of uh, senior leadership. Okay. Uh, in the example that I have given about limited face-to-face -face, uh, classes, so. We already had our consultation meeting with the stakeholders so that they would know uh, how we're going to go about with the initiatives okay okay and then um, after that we are equipping the whole university in terms of 
institutional plans in terms of uh, infrastructure, logistics, no? preparation of rooms, laboratories, signages all around so that the students will be able to uh, follow what the protocols are. Very important to establish the intermanual for the protocols uh, for everything that they need to do in the university. Right. So that's the way forward. What are the impacts of the pandemic on leadership nationwide and independent schools and other workplaces? What can we do to support leaders and sustain leadership in the years to come? So that is your next activity and I'd like you to work on that. You'll be given time to work on that. Okay? So the very real and universal feeling of burnout and uh, stress, no? so this is based on the study of National Association of Independent School and I'd like to share this with you because I'm pretty sure that you're also going through this so that um, we would know how we can avoid, okay? So we say that the longevity of the pandemic the endless monotony laced with acute anxiety had contributed to a sense that time was moving differently. The stress and tedium have dulled our ability to form meaningful new memories. That's really right. People may be having a harder time forming working memories and paying attention with a reduced ability to hold things in their minds, manipulate thoughts and plan for the future. Okay, according to the study of uh, Sara Lial, we have all hit a wall from the New York Times just recently in April 2021. So 34% uh, of the respondents are burned out, 22% uh, are stressed, I mean depressed, and then 37% uh, are stressed. So earlier in April 2020, burned out was just 27%, depressed was just 17%, and then stress was only 34%. That means uh, burnout, depression, and then stress are heightened no? uh, in few months time. So there must be a recent study now to find out if this is still true. Uh, but for me, maybe my assumption would be maybe it's going down because we already have established uh, protocols and we already have established uh, best practices that we just have to sustain no, in terms of implementation. So being burned out, depressed and stressed may be lessened through time because we already have adjusted to it. What do you think? Alright, burnout threatens progress in female leadership. Do you believe so? Because one in four women are contemplating downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce. That's according to McKinsey and Company from the study of Sarah Curry, Women in the Workplace, um, in September 2020. So she says that women, especially women of color, are more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during the COVID-19 crisis, stalling their careers and jeopardizing their financial security. The pandemic has intensified challenges that women already face. Companies risk losing women in leadership and future women leaders and unwinding years of painstakingly progress toward gender diversity. So, in spring 2020, women were four times more likely than men to not work so they could care of children and we know for a fact that the parents now especially the mothers are becoming teachers of the children at home because of virtual and modular learning and in fact the parents have to be graded instead of the students because they are the ones answering the modules <laughs> what do you think so if companies make significant investments in building a more flexible and empathetic workplace and there are signs that this is starting to happen, they can retain the employees most affected by today's crisis and nurture a culture in which women have equal opportunity to achieve their potential over the long term. Alright, so 
it really threatens uh, among female leaders but also of course among male leaders but more on female leadership okay so among senior level women feel that exhaustion and burnout the most no? so fewer companies have taken steps to adjust the norms and expectations that are most likely responsible for employee stress and burnout so less than a third of companies have adjusted their performance review criteria to account for the challenges created by the pandemic and only about half have updated employees in their plans for performance reviews of their productivity expectations during COVID-19. Kumusta naman si PBB? Nag-adjust ba? <laughs> Narilis ba PBB ng lahat? Uh, say A if yes. Alright, so you must be happy. So many companies need to do more to address challenges employees are facing during COVID-19. So consistent feelings at work in the past few months, no? So we have there uh, pressure to work more, burnt out and exhausted. So if you're going to see uh, the fathers, the mothers, the senior level men, the senior level women, the black men and the black women. So it's more of the senior level women who are uh, pressured to work more, burnt out and exhausted because you know, majority of them are working um, in the offices and then when they go home they still perform the functions as mothers so somehow we'd say they're domesticated and second to that is the senior level men but very close to it is the mothers as well so the black men are not really pressured <laughs> okay in terms of paradoxes of leadership, so this, there are six paradoxes which are becoming increasingly important for leaders to navigate on. These are not the only paradoxes leaders face, but the ones most urgent in today's context and will remain important in future. So the paradoxes should be considered as a system, so they impact each other and all need to be a balance simultaneously. Alright, so these are the six types no number one is humble hero you choose which leader are you number two is strategic um, executor number three is traditional innovator number four is technology savvy or humanists number five is globally minded localists and then number six is high integrity politician so where are you there okay find out where are you there Okay, for me personally, maybe I'm under number one, uh, number two, five. So these are my two strengths, maybe. Okay, so what about you? So what are the leadership skills needed for post-pandemic? So we say that good leaders will have to rebuild the boundaries between work and home life. So just last night, I had a sharing with the manager of a bank and he said that there is really a big disparity between um, your productivity when uh, you're working at home or you're working really in the office. And he said that it's really better to report to the office because he is more productive than staying at home because at home uh, just as he wakes up uh, from his uh, bed and without taking a bath uh, sometimes eating while attending to concerns and then uh, using different gadgets so there is a laptop there's a tablet and there's a cell phone so how can you have focus if you are that kind of worker, if you are that kind of leader? Okay, so respondents in a study by SENSE Global Alliance and Management Education believe leadership skills such as openness, empathy, resilience, and the ability to communicate will be of greater importance uh, uh, post-crisis. So again, these are the words, openness, empathy, resilience, and the ability to communicate 
very important attributes. Business leaders need to make investments in human capital through methods such as training and education, which is a chief uh, priority. That is really very true because we have to invest on humans. Our human resources is very important. Diversifying leadership ranks by developing junior talent. Do you believe in this? Of course, it's very important that we have to develop our junior talent. Sometimes our junior talents are the one developing us also. <laughs> so corporations across America are affirming their commitments to diversity today. Diversity efforts have struggled to deliver. Yeah, this is really right. The diverse people working in a company sometimes is really very hard to handle. So companies spend heavily on learning and development, but much of its focus on systems, product knowledge, compliance training or education benefits intended simply to keep employees engaged. Relatively little spent on measurable training to help workers move up. So as I mentioned earlier, I am an officer of the Region 8 Administrators League Incorporated or RIAL and I am the chairman for learning and development and in the previous year, we were able to come up with a um, Region 8 communication series of five uh, sessions of them where we gathered all the administrators and teachers in the region for a series of seminars. Yeah, so it's our way of developing our human resources in the region. And I'm very happy and proud to say that uh, we would be able to generate about 500 or more participants for our trainings and that's good number enough. So by understanding how the skills of two jobs overlap or approximate to one another, companies can create targeted training to support employees in bridging the skills and diversity gaps. It's also very important that we bridge the gaps of the employees. So whatever type you know like sex uh, gender or uh, age gaps um, women men uh, lgbtq uh, the pwd so we should be able to bridge the gaps of all these sorts no so based on the study white women and people of color make up 64 percent of entry level roles but only 30 percent of the executive uh, sweet. So how about in our country? So who among of them are accepted for entry-level roles? So do we have uh, categorization of in terms of gender or in terms of backer? So is it uh, uh, what you know or whom you know? All right. So that's for you to answer. In fact, there is a study on turnover among higher education presidents. So overall, the number of campus and system presidents stepping down appears to be within the normal range. In fact, fewer presidents have announced their retirements in 2020 than each of the previous two years. Some presidents may have put plans to leave and hold to stand by their institutions mid-crisis. Yeah, because normally those people who are elected into office as presidents are already of age right and so they're afraid also to brave the pandemic because sometimes they already have comorbidities so that's the reason i guess two big trends could emerge after covid-19 that will lead to a much larger rate of turnover so the first is burnout from needing through a prolonged crisis and then in addition many governing boards who are not entirely happy with their leadership but reluctant to undertake a search or waiting for a more stable environment. Yeah, so this is a worldwide uh, phenomenal problem. But of course, uh, there are leaders who would stick to their positions because that's what they aspired for for a long time maybe. Or maybe it's a sh pure sheer service that they want to do this why they stay there in the positions okay also we have a study on turnover among company leaders so the second quarter of 2020 saw fewer ceo succession announcements than the previous uh two years 
CEO transition in the middle of the crisis can be seen as unnecessary risk and trigger significant disruption in an already volatile situation. So those companies that did transition to a new leader generally chose to name a permanent one rather than an interim one, signaling a strong leadership mandate and confidence at the time when both their people and markets require reassurance. So in fact, in this study, it says that 11.3% decline in number of succession announcements in 2020 compared with 2018 and 2019 averages. Okay, so what is your uh, idea about the turnover of company leaders in your respective areas? Um, is it similar to this picture um, under the study of Macho, Tonelio, and Jason Slaughter? All right. Then, if we had the turnover of presidents, turnover of CEOs, let's look at the turnover among mayors and other politicians, maybe. So it's unclear whether mayor turnover is unusually high this year, but many who are stepping down cite COVID-19 as the reason for not seeking re-election. Yeah, because if this continues for quite a while, so I don't think that many politicians would still opt to run, but you know, in the Philippines we see that they're still, you know, running. I have a friend um, from Minnesota who is a mayor in Waldorf. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, he's contemplating on still seeking re-election for the next term, but he feels that um, his area is very manageable so far. Mayors are hands-on officials in the best of times barraged with criticisms and individual pleas for help. So over the last year, they found themselves weighing matters of life or death, devastating local businesses by prolonging shutdowns, canceling gatherings pressured by voters, and able to provide comfort by being there in person. That's very right. So multiple departing mayors expressed frustration with the politicized reaction to their health directives and the inability to let their guard down because of the cyclical unending nature of the pandemic. So that's according to the study of Ellen Barry, okay, from New York Times. So what about in our country? We are about to have our elections. It seems that our aspiring politicians are excited to run. In fact, we have a good number of presidentials, right? Who would like to be the president? So they're not afraid of the pandemic so they are very much excited to run different offices and if we see the lineup of uh, aspirants for politics a lot of them in the roster of all posts so that means maybe they're not afraid or maybe they're anticipating that soon COVID will be over so let us see what's going to happen All right, so we're moving on to the trends in independent school leadership. So for you, what are the trends that uh, you have in mind for your specific schools? Of course, the very common trend now is really virtual learning, uh, blended learning or hybrid learning or just modular learning so many terms have already emerged and uh, we cannot uh, avoid no? but engage into the different trends of learning at this time so the next slide would show us about the different trends in independent school leadership today's independent school heads slightly younger and slightly more diverse in gender and race Ethnicity. So this is a worldwide study by National Association of Independent Schools. According to Margaret Anro, um, most common age range of heads, so in 2019 to 2010, 38% of the heads were in the 50s and 35% in their 60s. In 2020 to 2021, 49% of heads are in the 50s, so it increased while just 25% are there in the 60s. That means they opt for early retirement already. So 80% have been in their current position for 10 years or fewer. So as in 
2009 to 2010, three fourths of current heads were external hires. All right. So percent of he heads who are female uh, in 2009 to 2013, percent, and it significantly increased in 2020 to 21 to 41 percent. That's good. So nearly half or 49% of all heads hired in the past five years identify as female. So we see that there's really good balance between male and female leadership. So percent of heads who are people of color, you have 5.2% to 10.6%. So there's a change, no? In 2009 to 2010, only 5.2% to 2020 to 2021 is already 10.6%. So that's more than 100% increase and that's good. Uh, today's independent school heads come to the job with administrative leadership experience. About a third of 2020 to 2021 National Association of Independent School Heads surveyed had previously served, served as interim or acting school heads. More than 40% had previously been an assistant or associate head, while 56% had served as a division head of a lower, middle, or upper school. So I guess this is also applicable to the Department of Education because normally it's like uh, you start from Dev Ed as teacher, then you become master teacher, or you become a head teacher, then principal, then later on maybe you opt to apply for a supervisor, assistant division superintendent or maybe to an ARD or to a regional director, right? So though a majority of today's heads feel very prepared overall for the role, that number of drops below half are financial related tasks, managing a school's overall financial health and fundraising related activities. So this could really be a challenge also to schools because your MOO, I guess, is just mega and you have to generate funds to support your program. So we say that while 80% of heads had been teachers at some point in their careers, only 30% had transitioned directly from teaching to headship. So look at the picture. So how is that related to our pictures in the Department of Education or in the higher education institutions or in SUCs? No? So it might also be similar. In fact, I noticed that um, in the university, for example, um, the teachers have been there for quite a long time and because of NBC five years, uh, it would take them years before they get uh, promoted and especially uh, being given assignments no, for headship, for administrative uh, functions. Okay. Areas in which um, today's heads feel most and least prepared. Uh, we see that the school heads say, I feel very prepared in working with parents and families. That's 90%. Serving as a community ambassador to recruit new families is 81%. Managing school climate or culture is 65%. Managing conflicts is 64%. Managing pandemic plans is 60%. Working with the board is 58%. Engaging in crisis risk management is 51%. Managing schools overall financial health is 48%. Fundraising activities is 40%. Handling legal issues is 35%. And addressing community polarization is um, 23%. So that's it. So it's still a huge number. Um, to increase the percentage, it still it requires a huge effort from among our leaders. But it's good that there's already ninety percent working with parents and families. That's very important. Tasks where heads and aspiring heads felt the most confident tended to be the most typical duties of attention. And often ones where aspiring heads can get practice through teaching or administrative duties. Areas where few respondents felt very prepared tended to involve issues made more complicated by the pandemic and racial reckoning. Okay, so for financial issues, which NICE had previously identified as a struggle for heads of school, 48% of heads felt prepared to manage your school's overall financial health, while only 40% felt very prepared in the area of fundraising. Yeah. 
So it's really a problem of fundraising. Heads are largely satisfied overall with their roles. If you're going to look at the graph, working in independent education is 92% overall satisfaction. Sense of community at school is 90% overall satisfaction. And then financial compensation is um, a little 84%. In addition to overall satisfaction, most heads of school are satisfied with the support they receive from their school community. That's very important that there is a support from the community. So 87% are somewhat or completely satisfied as well as with the support and advocacy they receive from their board, which is 84%. And the board chair is 87%. Congratulations to the board chair for that support. I hope it's the same support given to the SUCs now. So smaller number, however, are satisfied with the support their family receives from the school, which is 69%. And notably, three out of five heads are dissatisfied with the amount of time they have for themselves, their family, and their friends. So this can be, be a very big challenge for the school heads, not the limited time for the family and their friends, and even for themselves. So this level of dissatisfaction is 10 percentage points higher than in 2009. Now we move on to the aspects of headship that make the role worthwhile. Let us see how it goes. For seeing students grow and flourish, that is 92%. Making a difference in others' lives, that is 85%. Driving the vision forward is 80%, empowering others is 79%, opportunities to be a change maker is 77%, working with your administrative team is 72%, working in an organization that touches the future is 71%, mentoring the next generation of leaders is 70%, implementing creative programming is 67%, Working with teachers is 53%, uh, and then others not mentioned or identified is 7%. So 92% heads feel that seeing students grow and flourish makes the job worthwhile, and that is a wow, a big wow. And 85% found value in making a difference in others' lives. That's really a very important uh, character of a uh, head, no? That's what you want to uh, see to make your role worthwhile. So what are the current challenges that leave heads feeling the least satisfied? The increased pressure, stress, and isolation on me as a school leader, that is 64%. Helping the school community address the COVID-19 pandemic, racial injustice, and economic insecurity simultaneously, that is 57%. The constant need to make difficult decisions is 53%. Unknowns, constant change, and fear uh, complicating my ability to plan is 45%. The toll of remote learning on my students, families, faculty, and staff is 45%. Worrying about my community members' health and well-being is 40%. Difficulties with the school's budget and financial instability is 38%. Difficulty communicating with constituents without triggering a backlash is 35%. And others is 70%. Alright, so we see that the highest, no? current challenge that leave heads feeling the less satisfied is 64% uh, no? pressure, stress, and isolation as uh, challenges. Is it worth the stress? Being the head of an independent school is well worth the stress always or most of the time. So in 2009 to 2010, that's 86%. It goes down to 73% in 2020 to 21. All right. So people of color is 67%. Women is 66%. So compared to 2009, fewer heads of school and administrators today believe that headship is worth the stress. Wow. So that is something new. Maybe because of the so much bombardment of uh, 
pressures, challenges, and stress, so it becomes uh, not so worrisome for our leaders, okay? <laughs> so what are the sources of stress, the most stressful, challenging aspect of headship? No? Um, number one is personal health and well-being, that is 53%. Divided, difficult community is 41%. Unknowns, the constant change is 35%. Others' health and well-being is 28%. The three pandemics is 25%. Traditional headship and finances is 90%. And workload or learning model is 40%. So personal health and well-being top the least of stressful aspects of headship for today's heads. So what about you? What is your top of the list source of stress? So these are the different sources of stress. Increased pressure, stress and isolation or emotional burnout. There is pressure to solve global and national issues. Heads have taken a little time off and are struggling to find any time for their personal life. There's a feeling that they are supposed to take in everyone's stress but can show any stress or concern themselves. It's really very, very true. Many are struggling to find the energy to connect with others. Yes, because uh, sometimes people will look at you that you are the model. So. You don't get tired, you don't get stressed, so that they won't be affected. So there will be no domino effect to other people. Another source of stress is constant and more difficult decision making. So heads report constant decision making around COVID-19 and community issues. So nothing in the day today is uh, simple. Much of COVID-19 response is situational and dealt with on a case-to-case -case basis adding to the number and difficulty of decisions really it's very hard and sometimes you have to uh, collaborate with everyone it takes a village no to come up with resolutions to combat uh, covid heads also report an increase in people who believe they should be core decision makers in the process and adding frustration Another source of stress is unpredictability or the inability to plan. Majority of heads fear a COVID-19 outbreak and having to close. Many don't have time to plan when they're sinking and trying to stay afloat. That's really very, very true. So, but there should be someone to lift you up, right? Then another is polarization or the difficulty of communications. Sometimes it's hard to deliver the message. Most heads mention increased polarization. Some connected this to politics, but most mentioned the divided opinions and reopening the schools. So many mentioned the divide between faculty staff and parents and students. And then communications are more challenging and time consuming. Fear that any communication or lack thereof uh, could be a problem. Okay. So, but you know, I, as I said earlier, it's good that we have technology, that the GC is born because uh, there is a better way to communicate, okay? How trustees and administrators can support heads? So check in with the heads. With increased trust and understanding, the board will be less anxious about the tough decisions the head has to make during a crisis. This in turn will allow the head to move quickly without second guessing on the part of the board. And then uh, the board chair focus on the school's purpose, help provide an overarching vision. By unifying mission and response, the board chair helps the head keep a clear mind. But of course, that is in collaboration and coordination with all the members of the board of trustees or the board region. The administrators should foster a culture where leaders can openly discuss mental health. That's very important. So with more stress in their roles, heads of school are likely to feel more overworked and more isolated than ever before. So for trustees, embrace self-care as a component of the head or board partnership. For the board chair, foster a safe space. Part of the board chair's role is to function as a sounding board 
for the head. That's right. And then for the administrators, help with the workload. Can work with the head to reduce or redistribute his or her workload. Yeah, it's very important to empower and have a division of labor. So be paranoid but productively. Trustees need to work with the head of school to anticipate the most challenging scenario they can think of and then add what happens next. Yeah, that's really very important. So uh, there is a role that each office should play no? in the operation of the school or a certain office. Very important also to have self-care for heads. So these are the research-based tips. No? So number one is take some me time. For heads of school to be effective leaders who take care of others, especially during times of crisis, it's very critical that they take care of themselves and their loved ones. Secondly is practice self-compassion. Research has found that truly compassionate people are compassionate to themselves as well as others. They serve as motivating force for staff and colleagues. So if you don't have self-compassion, get out of your office. Don't be a leader or an administrator. Thirdly, build others' leadership capacity. That's very important. Distributed leadership model empowers staff to take ownership and lead more effectively. And it takes pressure off the head who doesn't have to do it all when he or she has a team to rely on. So if you are going to give an accomplishment report, do not uh, consider it's your accomplishment if it's the accomplishment of uh, the vice president, for example, or the directors. Maybe give them the time to share their experiences and their accomplishments because the peoples are the ones responsible to attribute it to you being the president or the leader of uh, the university or a certain agency, right? So don't have an entitlement of everything. So the current heads plans, more than half of the National Association of Independent School Heads intend to transition from their current jobs within the next five years with most either intending to retire or unsure of what they're doing next. Can you imagine that? 11% of them don't know what they want to do next. And then in the next one to two years, 23% of them would like to retire. In three to five years, 32% of them would like to retire. In six to 10 years, 24% of them would like to retire. In more than 10 years, 10% of them would like to retire. So 28% the pandemic influence uh, has decision to stay at or leave their jobs. However, 70% of the heads are leaving their jobs early with 9% leaving three plus years earlier than originally planned. Can you imagine that? But I guess that's really very true to our situation in the Department of Education and in the higher education institutes because, you know, we always stick to our uh, positions until retirement maybe. But of course, a few would consider retiring early. The succession planning and internal or external hiring, 83% uh, of current heads who say their school has a search process in place to find a head of school, 23%, no? um, a black and female independent school administrators with an interest in becoming a head believe that their school would consider them for headship should the position be available, suggesting some level of bias against the internal candidates. Yeah, that's very true. So research from the Connecticut Association of Independent Schools found that over a 10-year period, all internally hired heads were signed for a second contract compared to 65% of externally hired heads. So the pathways to leadership even as the pathways to headship remain overwhelmingly traditional, the cohort of aspiring heads is as much more diverse than it was in 2009 
and indeed more diverse than sitting heads and other administrative peers. So mentorship and sponsorship rates are almost as high among aspiring heads as they are among sitting heads, suggesting that many are on a track to grow as leaders and meet their goals. And although most administrators do not want to be heads, the majority still have leadership ambition within independent schools, either in progress or already fulfilled. So if you're going to look at that figure, the aspiring head cohort in 2020-21 is more diverse than it was in 29 to 2010. No? So 23% are people of color, 30% LGBTQ, and 55% uh, women. That's according to uh, Margaret Ann Rowe's study. On mentorship and sponsorship, 76% of current heads who feel they've benefited from being mentored. Aspiring heads are also well mentored, with 69% having been mentored. And then, um, although sponsorship is highly effective in terms of career advancement, it is less well known and few heads have sponsored anyone or been sponsored themselves, right? So sometimes it's really a personal journey or struggle to get there, right? So for leaders and aspiring leaders whose identities are traditionally marginalized, mentorship and to an even greater degree, sponsorship relationships have been shown to be particularly valuable. So in the National Association of Independent Schools survey, women were most likely likely to have mentors or sponsors than men. So while black and LGBTQ respondents were notably more likely to have them than their white or non-LGBTQ counterparts. So uh, in the local setting in the Philippines, for example, so I don't think we have studies similar to this now on black women, on the LGBTQ, and I suppose that uh, discrimination is not prevalent here in our country everyone is given equal opportunity right i hope so so these are the strategic questions about supporting leaders and sustaining leadership coming out of the pandemic what can we do to make the role of head more sustainable how can we move toward true distributed leadership to increase balance and capacity what can we learn from hiring and turnover trends in their industries? How can we regain the balance heads need between their personal and professional lives? How can we address heads' feelings of isolation? What can heads do to support each other and themselves? How can we nurture the leadership pipeline? Identify and encourage interests? Grow internal talent? Improve our hiring process? How can we enhance mentorship and sponsorship opportunities, particularly for heads and administrators whose identities are traditionally marginalized? How can we support new heads in their first year? And how can we make the board or head relationship a true partnership that sustains over time? So if you're going to take a look at these uh, questions, these are very good questions for, for you for action researches maybe or for studies that you might want to engage in uh, especially qualitative studies so that uh, you can generate um, responses from your respondents so later on uh, you will be given tasks to work on your workshop okay Alright, so we move on to managing work-related psychosocial risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is based now on International Labor Organization. So how do you manage psychosocial risk this time? So the impact of so psychosocial risk and work-related stress in the world of work, no? So the psychological responses would be low mood, low motivation, exhaustion, anxiety, depression, burnout, and even suicidal thoughts. So the physical reactions would be digestive problems, dermatological reactions, cardiovascular disease, 
musculoskeletal disorders, headaches or other unexplained aches and pains, and then increased risk of work injuries and accidents due to reduced accuracy, impact on workplace productivity, increased absenteeism and presenteeism, lower job engagement, and reduced job performance. So with respect to both the quality and quantity of work. So what about you? Uh, what are the psychosocial risks and work-related stress on the world of work? I presume this risks are similar to what I have shared with you now. So according to World Health Organization as well. Then the hazard identification and risk assessment during COVID-19 pandemic. So identify the potential sources of exposure to the novel coronavirus, considering all work areas and tasks performed by workers. Then identify any hazard that may arise due to OSH measures uh, and new work processes adapted to prevent contagion including psychosocial factors, economics, chemical and other hazards and then take into account external factors affecting mental health such as fear of being infected, losing a job, social isolation, the weight of domestic responsibilities, increase in the absence of schools and services and then think about new ways to detect hazards for workers at homes like questionnaires and surveys and then consider the individual characteristics of workers when assessing the risk associated with each hazard so uh, these are the ways you can identify hazard assess uh, risk at this time so you can have a copy of the slide and then maybe if you have not done this you can work on this. All right. So what is your best experience you can be proud of as a leader? So I'd like you to figure out what are those best experiences you have had, which you are proud of, or maybe you've been awarded because you did something great, you did something good. All right. Okay, so this is the survey that I conducted that I'd like to share with you. Also, you can also use this uh, material. So what are the challenges during this um, pandemic? These are the items. Determine if COVID complications affect career development in your organization. Integrate a new organizational structure, process, or system. Manage your organization and execute organizational strategy in the new normal. Implement improvement efforts, initiative, and services. Or maybe launch of a new product or service. Implement cost reduction or control procedures. Make database recommendations to enhance operational excellence. Implement improvements to produce or service quality and initiatives. Attract, develop, and retain talent and engage employees to drive efficiency. Create alignment and accountability and enforce internal controls, drive performance and increase revenue and profitability, build strong customer relationships and then champion the organization's goals to enhance its reputation. And then there might be other challenges that you'd like to add up. You're most welcome to improve the questionnaire. But uh, for this, uh, I'll be encouraging you to come up with your own survey, action research or study relative to this now in terms of challenges and this slide shows the opportunities okay so use COVID-19 as a time to reflect so have you been reflecting attend to physical and mental health that's very important it's an opportunity learn from what other managers are doing successfully tailor your brand stories responsibilities to the new reality expand your information sources Develop strategies in critical thinking. Lead in continuously changing environment. Develop and empower others to establish collective accountability for results. Promote linkaging and networking for productive partnerships. Enhance planning and organizing for greater impact. Uh, drive performance for integrity and service. 
promote products and services into new markets, domestic and global, and other opportunities that you might be able to add, which I have not identified in this uh, questionnaire, okay? And now we are nearing to our uh, last few slides. The next uh, slide from the survey that I conducted asked about what are your best practices during this pandemic. So uh, example item that I included, guide team to create new norms, protocols, and purpose, revisit shared purpose, reassess available resources, understand employees' constraints, reestablish norms, cultivate seven C's attributes shared by effective leaders, uh, that includes calm, confidence, communication, collaboration, community, compassion, and cash. Believe small talk works, big wonders, confront the unknown in your strategic planning, protect the core business function, and pivot to new opportunities, reward your loyal, high-performing employees, and then use technology to scale your organization to current conditions. New employees have rapid connections to key people and other best practices strategies that you can identify. So you can have your own insertions of best practices that you're doing, but this will serve as your guide. All right. So what are the areas for action? No? Um, we have environment and equipment, workload, work pace and work schedule, violence and harassment, work-life balance, job security, management leadership, communication, information and training, health promotion and prevention, of negative coping behaviors, social support, and psychological support. So uh, looking at all these areas, therefore, the Human Resource uh, Management Office should address this no? in collaboration with the planning office of your agency of course um, with the direction set by the head of the agency so that all these areas for action are taken care of okay and this will be the last activity for your workshop you'll be asked to make an action research survey in your respective areas of work and assignment of the topic of your choice or anchored on the topic that I presented. Challenges, opportunities, and best practices in management during pandemic. So uh, we can make use of the same because you are coming from different areas. Maybe you have different uh, challenges, opportunities, and be best practices that you can share. And so <clears throat> as part of the validation of your certificate and CPD points, so you're going to submit the output of your workshop all right so it has been a pleasure to be with you thank you so much for your attention so i don't know if you really give uh, focus or attention to our session but i'm pretty sure that um, you gain something new you might have learned or unlearned uh, lessons so again Thank you so much. So these are the resources and references of the session we have today. Thank you. And above all, thank you for your contribution to saving lives among many of the people that we serve. God bless everyone and be safe.